our town was started to help a conversation about what shapes the identity of St. Pete, and in general, to universalize what shapes the identity of a place or a city or a town. And we've had lots of different guests, and what we have found out through this is that it's no one person that um, shapes the identity of a place or a town or the identity of a person. It's an interlocking network of people doing many different things. Some people we know, some people we don't know. But it takes oftentimes certain special people, people who have vision, and people who not only have vision, but can put that vision into action. And so it seemed really fitting for me for the last um, speaker of 2012 that Peter Betzer should be the guest because he fits that description. He's a person who has great vision, and he's also a person that puts things into action. And what I've discovered through our many talks <laughs> is that one of the ways he does it is he creates a network. He really sees people for how talented they are and what they can do, and he helps to set us all in motion. And um, I hope through this conversation that we'll discover how he does that and why he does that and uh, what's so special about you. <laughs> Better turn and ask the people out there. <laughs> what you said about the vision, it's, I think many people have vision. I think the, the, uh, the wonder is in, in being able to interact with people like many of the people I see in the audience, mm -hmm. who are willing to essentially buy into an idea. And even though you may be uh, characterized as an Albanian village, I uh, <laughs> think you have a chance to do something really uh, exceptional. And mm -hmm. that's happened yeah. on quite a few occasions. So, so um, Hank began by talking about how you got here. And that's always my first question to my guests. How did you come to St. Pete? So you, could you tell us the tale, please? It starts on a Northwest jet going to Japan. My wife and I were sitting next to it. Turned out a postdoc. And your wife is? Susan. <laughs> right here. Yes. Watching my every move. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it turned out the postdoc was a, a good friend with Walter Monk who was writing a plenary session in Tokyo at these big meetings. And Ken Fanning, who's sitting there, and I were the representatives of the Graduate School of Oceanography. So it turns out somebody in the Philippines who was in the plenary lectures you know, for this thousands of scientists got sick. And so this guy got excited about my research, ran up to Walter Monk, and said, you ought to put this guy on, because he's really good. And I, I was horrified. I thought, And you were a graduate student? I was a graduate student. And here are all these famous people, like Monk is one of the great gods of physical oceanography. And he said, he came and talked to me for a while and said, yeah, the, you'll be great. Said, you know, or, <laughs> Heaven help us. So I, I gave this talk. And in the audience was Ken Carter, who was a faculty member at the University of South Florida. And he came to me afterwards and said, um, I really enjoyed that. And I think. Um, we have a position at the University of South Florida, and we'd love to have you apply. And um, I said, University of South Florida? <laughs> so, it's really, I was really smooth. I mean, if you come from the Northeastern establishment, right. uh, you're not really, you know, it's got to be up there or yeah. out on the West Coast. And, or it's nowhere. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so we were so impressed that Susan stayed home um, when I came down for an interview. <laughs> Um, and then I called her up and said, I really like these people. They're incredible. They're, I mean, there were only four of them. <laughs> and what did you like about them? Why did you think they were incredible? They uh, were <clears throat> very interactive and obviously liked each other a lot, even though they were really good scientists. And in um, some cases, <laughs> scientists are, it's can, can be slightly politics. difficult. Yes, yes yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and the other reason uh, was that um, the, the, per the person that invited me, Carter, was uh, his research interfaced beautifully with mine. And what was your research? My research, I was taking a look at um, very uh, finely divided amounts of iron and how it was distributed in the ocean. It turns out it's a critical nutrient for plant growth. And so yeah. I was taking a look at it. Um, iron in, iron is there in a the lot ocean. of iron? No, in very small amounts of huh. it in the ocean. What you can do is you can sort of tease out some of the 
important things that are happening in the ocean by taking a look at its distribution. Hmm. So that was hmm. um, what I was doing for a, a doctoral dissertation. And we discovered that everybody else that had been measuring it had done it wrong. And so oh, that wow. was sort of an insightful. Mm -hmm. um, didn't make a lot of friends, but <laughs> eventually I um, was shown to be correct, which was uh, satisfying. But anyway, the, the potential for doing some collaborative research with this guy was wonderful. So you decided to come? Well, it was a joint decision. And um, they and I said to so them. So did you phone Susan? or? Oh, yes, I phoned him. <laughs> oh, yeah. And she said, oh, no. <laughs> was, uh, this wasn't the plan. Um, and the thing is, mm -hmm. is that people know Susan as a doctor, but she has a PhD in marine science. Yes. Yeah, she was a very good uh, biochemist who mm -hmm. did a lot of top-notch research. Actually had a postdoctoral fellowship when we were first here, um, but then decided that she would be much happier interacting with people than Dead slicing up and analyzing. Iron. Well, yeah. no, she was actually working in organisms. So mm. that was, and I, I thought that was a great decision, and it, mm. I think a lot of people in the room do too. So, <laughs> so when you came here, um, how long ago was that? Let's see, it would be 41 years ago, coming hey. up in um, September. So things were a little different than they are now. Yes. <laughs> um, so could, yeah. you ex could you tell us wow. what it was like when you arrived? Well, first of all, um, for those of you that think of the University of South Florida St. Petersburg as that wonderful, beautiful waterfront campus, forget it. Everything was stuffed out on that 11-acre peninsula. So all of marine science, all five of us, and 12 graduate students, and the entire undergraduate program were in the big uh, building at the end of the peninsula. And then there was a termite-ridden, H-shaped wooden building that was uh, there that was for the undergraduate program. So we were all out there. And that, that included the library, I might add, um, as well as the machine shop and everything else. Um, <laughs> You couldn't see across the harbor to where Pointer Institute is because there was a giant shell ash mound there that was being used to feed the interstate uh, feeder system that was coming in and the harbor so itself. So that's from 270, it's 175, 175 coming in from 270. 375. 375, yeah. yeah. The, there were machine shops, there were yacht repair groups, and there was a wonderful bar, a tremendous place called the Stick and Rudder. Um, yeah. uh, some on, of us, on what we think of this oh, campus? Oh, it's, it's uh, right next to the waterfront, mm -hmm. indeed. Uh -huh. uh, it was, uh, to put it mildly, it was uh, an eyesore, and I think some characterized it as the armpit of St. Petersburg. <laughs> my, my sister was so impressed with it, she came down to visit. She looked at this, and she looked at me, and she said, so this is what you get with a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, it was, it was different. <laughs> And it wasn't that much different when the fannings came either, but then they, it actually started to change. Okay, so, so, so here you come, and um, you're happy to be here because you get to work with someone who's doing research like yes. you, intellectually stimulating. Um, your wife agrees to come. Yes. Um, she must have loved you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> And she finds her way to medical school and a whole yes. career. Um, and you come from this one building, the big building yes. out on the point, into this incredible um, marine science college. Yes. How do we get from that to what we have now? How did, how did you and your group, because I, I know it's a, mm -hmm. a group that does it, yes. how did you have the vision and the wherewithal to make that happen and not just sit in your laboratories and do your thing. Well, I actually, I did sit in my laboratories for quite a while. And I, I spent years at sea, which I suppose is a testimonial to a low IQ. But um, <laughs> uh, the, to, to say that I had the vision is, I, th I think that's, a, I, I, what you could see is the tremendous potential of the place. And, and how did you see that? It, it, you know, I, I saw it, it was seen in 1948 by uh, a professor at FSU, mm -hmm. Harold Hum, a very famous botanist, who actually told the administration at Florida State University, eventually St. Peter's will be the Marine Science Center for the state of Florida. Really? And if you mm -hmm. have any, um, you know, wherewithal and wits about you, 
you will establish an FSU chapter in St. Petersburg. He was the first department chair when I came. And when so Susan was, and I came. it was connected with FSU? No, it never was. The, uh, the FSU just ignored him. They, they didn't thought listen he was, to they the didn't wise listen words. to this guy. Uh -huh. um, huh. And in fact, when we first got here, the, um, the idea about having marine science at all was not viewed with a lot of positive feeling on the Tampa campus, which Kent and I were both told we'd have been much better to go back to the chemistry department over there, and you can forget all the stuff about marine science. Um, and that's to be remembered that you really are affiliated with the Tampa, Tampa. campus, yes, and still correct. are. Yes, mm -hmm. right. The, the big thing that happened was we had a wonderful uh, vice president for academic affairs named Carl Riggs, and he really uh, thought that we were exceptional. I mean, we got the very first um, contract from the Office of Naval Research that university ever had, and we wrote it the first time. We, it was funded completely for three years, which and was, what un was it for? unheard of, to take a look at basically the optical properties of the ocean and how they were influenced by suspended materials. So the Navy was very interested in that from the standpoint of acoustic signals and mm -hmm. um, submarine transport. Mm -hmm. So we were happy to take a look at that. And did all five of you work on that? No, just two of us. Two of us. Two of us did, and mm -hmm. um, so the, um, it turned out each of the universities in the state had an opportunity to designate one department as a center of excellence. Riggs picked marine science in St. Petersburg. And was Riggs in Tampa? Or yes, he was over there. Really? And so all of a How sudden. How did that happen? Did, he bri did you bribe him? Or did no. He <laughs> He, he, was, he was really a remarkable person. He, uh -huh. he had a distinguished academic career as an ichthyologist. He, I think he looked at our publications. He looked huh. at the, the tremendous uh, grants mm -hmm. and the, what our students yeah. were doing, and he said, this is a really good group. They huh. know what they're doing. Yeah. They're young. You can attract uh -huh. good people with all these young people. So all of a sudden, that we were nine people, and all of a sudden, the state gave us eight positions. So almost we doubled the size overnight. And what year is this? 1978. So not soon after you... Not soon after. Wow, that's really impressive. Now it turns out he was pretty, he was a very shrewd guy. Where because, is he now? Well, he unfortunately died. Um, uh, but uh, he was uh, very instrumental hmm. in the evolution of marine science. And, and it, it couldn't have been months later when that was announced and we advertised the positions that a member of the National Academy of Sciences applies for one of the positions. And of course, at South Florida, it wouldn't matter if you were um, Mohammed. You have to get letters of recommendation. <laughs> so he asked his good friend Wallace Broker, who was uh, quite a cervic um, guy, very brilliant. He was in the National Academy. He had to write him a letter of recommendation to the people in Tampa, you know, to get a job. Right. Um, Broker's letter, and I'm sorry I don't have it anymore, says, Dear Sirs, if you think you can actually get Robert M. Garrels to come to the University of South Florida. You all roll a red carpet all the way to Evanston. And he's here. Signed, Wallace S. Broker. <laughs> Honest to goodness. Oh, and, but Garrels came. <laughs> he was accepted despite the letter. And so, <laughs> so, and he was a wonderful, an incredible colleague. And mm -hmm. it was perfect because here was this older, basically um, maybe one of the two or three best geochemists the world's ever seen. Mm -hmm. He was Harvard University, had a fesh rift in his honor shortly after he arrived. Mm -hmm. He uh, mentored a bunch of students here. He was absolutely a phenomenal person. And the remarkable thing was people showed up from all over the world uh -huh. just to talk to him. Wow. Yeah. And they came to St. Pete? Just, and they came to St. Pete. Right. And all of a sudden it's like, hey, yeah. we're sort of the hotbed for mm -hmm. You know, it's maybe like a great arts community or whatever. Mm -hmm. People right. hear about it and they start coming. That's right. So that happened here. So, I mean, one thing about St. Pete is clearly we're on the water. Yes. We have a bay, an estuary. We're close to the Gulf and right. hooked up to the rest of the world. Yes. So, I mean, it seems in some way marine science makes complete sense to be yes. here. Where else in our country do we have that same setup? and have a really good marine science? Well, OK, uh, Scripps um, Institution of Oceanography. Um, in California. Not, in California. Um, at Seattle, Washington, the University of Washington has a superb uh, mm -hmm. facility. Um, 
the University of Rhode Island and Woods Hole, both in the Northeast, are That's where you were directly on, on mm -hmm. um, the water. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the uh, Miami, the Rosensteel School in Miami is one of the mm -hmm. places um, that's on the water. Most of the other universities that have marine stations, uh, they're, they're remote facilities, and so they're not located like Duke, mm -hmm. North Carolina, those places have or even Florida State, their people are located mainly in their campus and they have an outpost on the Gulf mm -hmm. kind of thing. That's, that's the usual situation. So having a, a setup like we do, where we, we have a port and basically the ability to have ships right there with mm -hmm. machine shops is a, is a wonderful advantage for an oceanographer. So there's a few other places in the country that have similar sort of facilities. So why has St. Pete become really special in this regard? Well, we, we were really fortunate because I, I think as a, a group that had been, you know, we, you start out stuffed, stuffed on a peninsula, okay, with all kinds of, and it, it, our laboratories were terrible and everything else, and, we, and so we sort of felt abused. <laughs> so instead of going to the university and complaining, we went uptown. What's <clears throat> that mean? Downtown St. Petersburg. So we started talking to people like Jack Lake, Okay, you have to say Jack, Jack. John B. Lake was the publisher of the of the St. Petersburg Times, arguably one of the most powerful people hmm. around. Um, was the, he was, was a champion of 70s? baseball. This was this would have been seventy five or seventy six, okay. and we really took a chance because we were on tenure, and you know oh, here you go really? into this oh yeah you go into this guy's office and yeah. you know and yes you're here for what and so it was great. <laughs> Um, no, but Jack was really, really smart, yeah. and he realized, no, we need more people like that in town. And all of a sudden, um, you know, things start, started to happen. Did and they give you money? They actually helped out in a lot of ways. He uh, got, uh, I, I can't prove it, but I think he was one of the main reasons we got the Ph.D. program, because USF applied for it, but they kept getting, running into okay. trouble. Like, we don't right. want to because we have one at Florida State. Right. Um, and um, anyway, Jack, oh, um, Jack did. Um, so he had influence. He in had influence. He had influence with the board of, of mm. regents. Um, one of who, mm. the chair uh, had a yacht here, and um, <laughs> <coughs> and was a member of the yacht club. And so anyway, Jack was. He he never he would never admit it, uh -huh. but in any case, that he was very helpful. But then you follow on with uh, Paul Getting, Marty Normile, who's here. And you have a wonderful business community who decided, yes, we need to really try and develop marine science. So uh, with that kind of wallop, and the city was behind mm -hmm. us, the business Who community. was mayor then? Let's see, the mayor. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I know the vice mayor was Claude Green, who became a big champion of marine mm -hmm. science. And he was the head of a thing called the Gulf Oceanographic Charitable Trust and gave the first they gave the first two endowed fellowships in marine science. And in yeah. fact, they were the first endowed funds that ever got matching funds from the state of Florida. Hmm. He did it within 48 hours of Governor Graham signing the major gifts program. Hmm. And it was the first two USF ever got. So anyway, we had the whole, we basically started to get the town excited about marine hmm. science. So when you really look at that beautiful new 120,000 oh. square foot building, mm -hmm. you think Marnie Normile, Paul Getting, uh, Larry Arnold, um, Lars Hafner, Peter Rudy Wallace, um, they all and he, Peter went to was bat. In Peter was the in the legislature. legislature, yes. Right. How many of these people are in the audience that um, Peter's just mentioned? Marty Norvile is. Yes. He's right there. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> and in fact, <laughs> the. Uh, the, the most incredible thing, my first major legislative experience was about the building. Um, we went up to see Mary Grizzle, who was a wonderful, a long-term Republican senator from this area. She loved the idea of having a new building. So we get up there, and a, a lobbyist from the city and myself and one other person whom I can't remember is sitting there, and Mary said, okay, Peter, I'm going to call Gwen. Gwen? Gwen Margolis, president of the Senate. <laughs> You'll have three minutes. It's your building or not. She picked up the phone, and Gwen came up, walked up several flights of stairs, comes in, and you know, she doesn't take any prisoners. She looks over at Mary, and Mary said, I'd like you to hear from this guy. 
She looks over at me, and I could see, boy, this better be really good. <laughs> so I gave my three minutes, and there was silence in the room, and I thought, well, I failed. That's horrible. She looked. Margolis looks over at Grizzle and said, Mary, how long have you been in the Senate? 27 years. Have we ever given you a building? No. You got it. <laughs> that happened. The, the lobbyist wow. for St. Petersburg said, my God, Betzer, you just got a building. Wow. <laughs> you know, she was on the plane on the way back, Margolis, and she, she waved at me, and he was like, okay. Wow. Yeah. That is good. That, that's wonderful. <laughs> I know. That's my introduction to Florida politics. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that was a, a wonderful joint facility, and it mm -hmm. still is, and mm -hmm. uh, that we share with the uh, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. So what's so neat about this story is, you know, it's particular to <laughs> marine science, but you know, it's a model for, and we've heard it from other people in different mm -hmm. ways. Right. You know, you come and there's this pile of junk, and then there's people who have a vision and have chutzpah, and they go and they talk their talk to the people, and People in power really like that. And yeah. people then get behind that excitement. But it's also, I mean, really smart excitement. It's not just, you know, things that are worked right. out. And we see it happening in the city now. Uh, you know, yes. people want that to happen. And this is such a remarkable story and mm -hmm. how multi layered it is and how many people are, are involved and how complicated it is. You oh, have yeah. to go to the state. You have to do all oh, of yeah. this, right. um, and it's not done overnight. I mean, it takes a while. And it took us. It took us um, over two years because the first time the money went in, it was actually vetoed by a staff member in the background who didn't like the idea of a building down here that was a joint use mm -hmm. facility. And then we found out who it was, and then Peter Wallace and others took very careful, uh, made very sure that no vetoes were going to be mm -hmm. um, given to our. Our building, but Marty, uh, Marty also, uh, and Paul Getting and others were in on the the first national competition I'm aware of that USF ever had was for the U.S. Geological Survey. We went up against 26 universities, and um, everybody thought the miracle was we made the final four. Okay, so the final four was Columbia University of Rhode Island, and then a triumvirate from North Carolina. Those ne'er ne'er do wells: Duke, North Carolina State, North Carolina. Right, Chapel right. Hill. So the last place this 10-member review team visited was here. <clears throat> and it was great because the chancellor of the state university system, representatives from FSU, our business community, donors, Andy Barnes, Tampa Bay Times, you know, the, everybody was there making incredible presentations. It was written up the next day in the paper, and a very eminent scholar from Duke who just wrote a, an op-ed in the Tampa Bay Times about coastal erosion and Hurricane Sandy saw me in the hallway, and he said, there's no damn way anybody can beat what you've put together. <laughs> and I thought, wow. We found out later the vote of the Science yeah. Re Review Committee that they came from all over the United States was 10 to nothing in favor of South Florida, it's okay? So good. <clears throat> now, was, yeah. this USGS is um, in the Studebaker building, and it's on 4th and 6th on the yeah. corner. Right. I did, and you know, it's interesting because so many States people, Geological Survey. yeah, the Huffs and the Von Rosensteels and the Downtown Partnership helped us do that. The city put up $711,000 for the building because the building at the time we asked for it from Mayor Ulrich, and he was wonderful. He said, you got it. Two weeks later, we had the title to the building, and we can mm -hmm. use that as a lever to get the USGS. The last five years, I added up how much money that they have invested in this town just supporting the facility, $71 million. Five years, $71 million. That's $14 million a year. The city put in $711,000. The graduate program at USF in marine science received over $1.2 million, supported in that period 55 graduate students by my calculations, okay? Because some of the money they give goes to graduate students in marine science. Um, Pam Halleck Muller, who's sitting here, has done collaborative now, research. That? Pam is sitting right here. Can you raise your hand? <coughs> okay. 
she's, she's one of the great mentor faculty members of the College of Marine Science. And um, we has collaborated on coral reef uh, work and research uh, for many years successfully. They have a, had a very good uh, research team. Um, in any case, graduate students from marine science can work over there. Um, we have a joint lecture series, thanks to the Tampa Bay Times, the eminent scholars that brings four or five eminent people from around the world in every year. Um, and uh, they have, they help Eckerd College. They give lectures at St. Pete High and other places. Uh, they participate in the Science Bowl. Um, they support the, marine, the machine shop in marine science. And they help bring international meetings here. And other than that, they don't do anything. For them. <laughs> so who are the marine science faculty that are here? Yeah. And are there um, any graduate students here? Yeah. Well, that's. Well, you, it, it's interesting because Jodica raised her hand. And of course, a couple months ago, Jodica was interviewed. Yeah. Jodica Hurricane Jodica. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, Jodica, you're not a graduate student anymore. Oh, that's right. And then the, yeah. the wonderful person I told you about, the story, the wonderful story, the really incredibly bright Renee yeah. Bernstein is sitting right here. So I told Renee's story. Yeah, um, to me. Oh, to, oh, about it. Oh, it was wonderful yeah. because it's about the wonderful science and, and attracting great, smart people. So we're at sea one time, and so Renee and I and a whole bunch of people are out working, and Renee <laughs> brings me over and says, Peter, look at this. This is this, what we have is unlike anything we've ever seen. I said, well, you're right, Renee. I don't know what it is. <laughs> so she said, I think it's an acantherian. Well, okay, so it's a protozoan. An but Right, so but we it, all it, know what that is. It, <laughs> yeah, you don't know it, but it's in your toilet, you know, your faucets every day. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> but in any case, it turns out it's a very, very important organism. It controls the strontium budget in the ocean. Well, Renee was convinced this thing was an acantherian, and nobody had reported this. I mean, the biologists knew about it, but nobody that had ever done sampling in the ocean that I was aware of with these big sediment traps we used had ever found them. So Renee um, called up one of the great gods of, of oceanography, Susu Mohanjo from Woods Hole, and said, um, you know, Sus, I think I have found acantherians in our sediment traps. And I think the response was, that's impossible. We've never seen them. So Renee, without missing a beat, said, well, why don't I send you this thing and you tell me what it is? <laughs> yeah, about two weeks later, the phone rings and Sue says, my goodness, this is incredible. You've got acantherians. <laughs> and, <laughs> She didn't miss a beat again. I thought, I think that's what I said the first time. <laughs> so then there's a paper in Science Magazine and everything. So it's wonderful to have really bright graduate students. I mean, what a, this room is filled with uh, <laughs> quite a collection. So, yes. OK, so we have marine science. We talk about the money, the economic thing. Right. So. Why, except for the faculty and these graduate students, why should we all be so excited about marine science being here and think that it should be like even bigger? Well, if you saw the article that Craig Pittman wrote in the Tampa Bay Times yes, about our, our giant springs and our, uh, that we have and our fresh water supply, uh, I don't know about the rest of the people in the room, but I was, to me that was sobering. And Do you want fact, to explain that? Because some people may not have read well, it. Well, if you haven't read the article, you really need to read the article. It was in last Sunday's paper, and it was a, a magnificent piece of work, although it was depressing, by uh, Craig Pittman. And uh, it showed that our, the giant springs in our state had, had, in many cases, slowed to a trickle. In other cases, that uh, they had dried up, or they, had, they still existed. There still was water, but you had basically uh, algal blooms, in some cases, toxic. On it, and when you took a look at the composition of the springs, and they only looked at one thing, which is nitrate, which is interesting because about 15 years ago, one of the really good faculty in marine science, John Paul, came to me and said, it looks like the nitrogen is increasing in the springs that we're looking at. In any case, this is an indication of, of sewage input, okay? So what happened in North Carolina when the pig farms got, you know, they 
wash them off. And so sewage input into our springs. Into our springs. And Correct. how does that sewage get into our springs? Well, you, we're sort of like a giant piece of Swiss cheese, if you will. I mean, it's sort of, I mean, Al Heinz here, and you could better explain it. Nonetheless, we have a little bit of a sand layer on top of, of calcium carbonate, which dissolves up in, in the face of acid attack. Can you say what calcium carbonate is? It's like limestone. Okay. So, you. you know, if you take a look at a piece of coral, uh, fossil coral, whatever, it's basically organisms that built this matrix of calcium and carbonate. So it's a, it's a mineral. It, it's susceptible to acid attack. So when you see gravestones that are etched, usually they're made out of some kind of calcium mm -hmm. carbonate. So not surprisingly, our, our springs, which basically go through tunnels of this, mm -hmm. can get enlarged by, a, you know, the acid just eats away the walls. And so we have sinkholes in the, mm -hmm. in the place. Um, and in any case, the drawdown of the water that has been used to, for agricultural purposes, for golf courses, for drinking water, and on and on and on, I think we've finally gotten to the point where we exceeded basically our, the capacity of the natural system to support the amount of water that we're using. And in addition, we're starting now actually to modify the composition of this giant reservoir of fresh water, which mm -hmm. most people would have thought impossible. Mm -hmm. So we are going to need some people to know an awful lot of about water. Um, if you think about beach erosion and our beaches, which are a multi-billion dollar um, industry, coral reefs that Pam works on and other colleagues, um, marine scientists um, work on those. Um, we have a $24 billion fishing industry, commercial and sports, on the West Florida Shelf. This is something that Bill Hogarth, the acting chancellor, and he He's here, and yeah. he's got a great Where idea about Bill? Bill's right back there. Oh, yes, there you are. There's, um, we know, we really don't know that much about something that is a huge part of our economy. And it's going to take some very talented marine scientists to figure out um, spawning habits, life histories, and bas basically uh, what's, what is it that's safe in terms of taking our population of gag grouper, Redfish, I mean, any, anything. So we, we have to have and we need very much a, a, a healthy marine science, a contingent of marine scientists. And there's red tide, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So the thing about talking about the water in our springs and the aquifer, yes. when you say it takes marine scientists, I think of marine scientists when I hear it as marine, like ocean and yes. golf. Sure. So how, why would a marine scientist work on springs, natural water, uh, well, not salt water? If you take a look out here and uh, just what to the mm -hmm. east of us a little bit, we have a, a giant estuary where yes, there's basically the mixing of fresh mm -hmm. and salt waters. And in fact, in some parts of our state, salt water has intruded into the aquifer. Uh -huh. So. Um, and how does that happen? Well, if you no, suck out enough, if you suck out enough water and you create a void, then the salt water can rush in. Or alternatively, we might be mm -hmm. facing in a couple of decades a sea level rise that's sufficient enough to actually flood the aquifer, which is mm -hmm. going to be a sobering um, event if it happens. So, the the answer to the question is, mm -hmm. people like Kent Fanning and Pam and Bob Byrne, who who actually look at the composition of a, of the ocean. Mm -hmm it's actually much more difficult in most cases to look at nutrients there because they're so much lower, mm -hmm. trace metals. And so when you go into fresh water, it's a piece of cake. There's no salt mm -hmm. to interfere with your measurements. The levels are normally much higher. Mm -hmm. So an oceanographer, a good chemist, could go into fresh water mm -hmm. and that's no problem. We can do it. Okay. No. <laughs> and so, and, and, you, and it turns out you really need it. Mm -hmm. okay. so, the first part of this, or the bulk of what you just said, is like some horror movie, yeah. like Independence Day or something like that. Yes. Okay. Now, the last little bit was we have these scientists who are going to solve the problem. Is that true? No, I didn't mean it that way. I meant that the, I, I, uh, hopefully they will help define the problem okay. in, in, uh, because I don't, I mean, to see the water disappear, then well, why exactly? So how so is there do we something solve we can the problem do so I can keep that? drinking this 
water. Drinking the water. Mm -hmm. um, well, I suspect that uh, the, a simple-minded answer is we're going to have to decrease the amount of, of pumping that we do, and we probably are going to have to install more desalination plants in the area. Uh, we have one, I think, that provides about 20% of our water. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to need more than that to support a population like we have right now. So there, you're obviously going to have to do some testing to see what it is that it's going to take to get these things back to where they ought to be to be healthy. Mm -hmm. And so we can rely on a, a safe drinking water supply. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it has to be done. It's just that the way the state seems to be going right now mm -hmm. is actually the wrong way, okay? Mm -hmm. Because nobody is, they've removed the people who have been right. charged with um, monitoring our, our fresh water. So, I, so maybe you have to go up to Tallahassee again and have see, your three minutes. I, I, think, I think that'd probably be a mistake. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> but, okay, so here's the thing that really interests me in this. In the details of the science, I, of course, find fascinating because we generally get just this general view. But what we need to know yeah. is the details. That's right. Because if we, if we as a general public, as a community, don't know the details, there's no way of acting on it. There's no way of supporting. You know, mm -hmm. you can come out and say, oh, we have to do this. But unless right. we are filled with details, we're not going to be as supportive of this. And to, mm -hmm. and to hear, one, that there's a situation, but two, that there are actually people, and in our community, yes. that can really... Um, um, address this issue is pretty, um, pretty incredible. It really, we really do have um, remarkable, the, the scientists, obviously I'm really prejudiced, but um, there's a guy here, they fly around the world because he solved an age old mystery of 100 years old, uh, did a mathematical formulation for the circulation of the giant planets. Okay? Sitting back there is Maya Breitbart. She's, she was an assistant professor flown to Sweden Where is she? to give a, a talk for a, a senior molecular biologist in Sweden. So she was singled out by somebody in another country. That's astounding. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we've got with the talents here. Mm -hmm. I think St. Petersburg has always had the talent. It's how do you get the talent in the arts, in the sciences, in the medical arenas to work together effectively? Because if you do that, I, I don't think, I mean, if look, if we could do the USGS and other stuff, come on. The rest of it's, yeah. So, so now, you, you're this dean of um, the College of Marine Science. No, I'm not. No, no I know. I know. I mean, yeah. then you were. Yeah. And now yes. you've moved to be president, moved to be president of Downtown Partnership, which puts you in a position to then look at all these pieces. Marine science is here. All the arts are here. Um, right the great newspaper we have, all of these elements. And yeah. as president of Downtown Partnership, um, what powers do you have? Ab absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> absolutely. We have to make that clear from the beginning. <laughs> In order to, to make this happen. Well, the, no, the best I could do is I have to go find really smart people like Helen Levine and Larry Langbreak. Uh, and, and others. And they're here. They're, Helen's here. Where's yeah, Helen? Helen's here, sure. Somewhere. There she is. Yeah. So uh, the partnership, for instance, one of the projects we um, helped start was a Sun Bay digital map. And it couldn't have happened without... And that was SRI. <clears throat> That's and SRI. US. And USF St. Petersburg. And thankfully, the Pinellas County School System jumped in uh, full bore. And the College of Education, Vivian Fuejo, the, the mm -hmm. uh, former dean there, um, it's a remarkable thing. All I can say is the test scores of the kids that, that had this new mathematics can it's you for talk middle schools. About that? Yes. Explain it. <clears throat> and um, how it happened and why we have it. Um, Curtis Carlson, the CEO of SRI, we invited him to give a talk at one of the quarterly luncheons for the Downtown Partnership. And he talked about, for about five minutes, about computer mouses, which they invented, it, barcoding and bank checks, what they invented, it, robotic surgery, they invented, Siri, they invented, I mean, okay. So and billions of dollars. And was SRI here at that time? Or? Yes, okay. he came only because they had a, a group here. So we invited him. The, the last thing he said was amazing. He said, look, the most important thing 
I've ever, I'm ever going to do in my career is try to get the United States squared away on mathematics in a K through 12 system. And he really meant it. And he gave an example of a program that had, that had been just a, they did a pilot test in Texas. The reaction of the teachers and the, the kids were unbelievable. It didn't matter if you were African American, Hispanic, white, male, female, pre and reduced lunch or none. I mean, it, everybody improved drastically. So, um, and the secret to it is an interactive relationship between the teacher and the student. That, that so um, there's like these little learning centers where they recognize that kids learn different ways. Mm -hmm. Some like equations, some like stories, some like video images, so on and so forth. And so all means of learning, that's fine. So they, Carlson, I, I talked to Carlson, I said, look, would you ever be willing to try that program out here? He said, well, how do you think you could get it in your school system? I said, I think the principal, the superintendent will talk to you. He said, oh, come on. I said, so I called up Julie Jansen's office, and she met us at Panera. <clears throat> On Fourth Street? Yeah. <laughs> ten, ten minutes later, this guy's got a napkin and a couple of equations. And she said, I get it. What do you want? He said, I want some middle schools. And he said, she said, you got it. We'll do anything you need. And uh, um, then we got the Helicon, Hel I'm sorry, yeah, Hel Helios Foundation and um, the Pinellas Education Foundation. And all of a sudden, seven middle schools so they off. provided the funds. They provided the funds. And then Progress Energy came in and gave money to train teachers in the summer so that they could get a certificate in digital, what they called Sunday Digital Math. The astounding thing happened last year is that a, a mathematics contest for the entire county, every one of the winners, every one of them from a public school came from a classroom that had Sunday Digital mm -hmm. Math. The top school in the entire county was the Sun Bay Dunedin Middle School, was the Sun Bay Digital Math Group. So let me tell you, it works. And I was a doubting Thomas. I had to listen to the teachers say to me, it transformed my classroom. So anyway, we have no power, but we can, if we can convince really bright, capable people, mm -hmm. then we can get things done. Mm -hmm. So, um, But the thing is, doing. you're willing to make the phone call and oh, yeah. do the convincing. That's my job. <laughs> so if I can, I think I'm dead on arrival. Come on. No, so Carl, Carlson, you know what? I think St. Petersburg has an inferior, inferiority complex. Carlson actually says um, this would not have been possible in California. We could never have done it in California in five years. Okay? And the other thing is, this is a guy who's trotted all over the world and he's paid royally to give classes on innovation everywhere. And he uses, as a major example for innovation, St. Petersburg, Florida, and the Sun Bay Digital Math Program. So no, we're, we're being touted everywhere. We just don't realize it. <laughs> but you know what? I think we do. Oh, OK, good. I'm I mean, I that. really think that as a community, I think we're really getting how special we yeah. are. And that, um, that we're just getting more and more special. And I think that with, you mm -hmm. know, with the rise of what the um, marine science and that whole mm -hmm. big conglomerate's doing, and it's getting right. bigger and bigger, and now, you know, yeah. moving in and collaborating yes. with um, lots of people. And, and the size of St. Pete. Perfect. It's just right. It's it not too small, it not too big. It's just right. <laughs> I knew you'd like that. <laughs> that sort of clears the deck. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came here, Helen? <laughs> um, so, okay. So we have all of this. What is your vision? Like, you have to more work to do. Oh, yeah. So where are you going? What's the vision? What steps are you going to be taking now? Well, I think that with uh, uh, people like Bill Hogarth and Helen and the school system uh, and great teachers, I, I think that the, uh, this could become a center for uh, education and innovation and in education. 
I have no doubts about it. Do you mean at all mm -hmm. levels, at the university yes, level? Yes, all levels. If you, and if, yes, so that's, mm -hmm. that's number one. So it's going to take the university, it's going to take SRI, it's going to take the teachers, uh, it's going to take our business community. We're really poised. We're right at the edge of it. And I think that, that we have a really excellent chance um, to have this happen right here. And SRI is thinking seriously about having something like that mm. hopefully happen here. Mm. So that's, that's um, number one. I and is the arts community going to be involved <clears throat> in this? Oh, I certainly hope so, because the, the creative part of this is, I mean, the mm -hmm. fact that you're doing storytelling and imagery and everything else, mm -hmm. I mean, clearly that has, uh, that evokes all kinds of things. And I think SRI is smart to realize that you have to have that in there to capture certain minds. Mm -hmm. they, the great thing about it is they pretend they know nothing. Mm -hmm. they SRI know, SRI, particularly, we know a little bit about equations, but mm -hmm. you, the student, and you, the teacher, can really help us bring this to life and make it real and make it work. Mm -hmm. So that they're, they really are great at, at uh, collaborating. Mm -hmm. So in, in the vision, the other vision is in marine science. Take a look at it right now. We have the Cousteau Center at Canterbury. So Canterbury School has. You want to uh, say a few words about the Cousteau Center? Yeah, the Cousteau, um, we, I met him in 2011 in France, uh, sorry, in Spain. This is the youngest. The son. youngest, Pierre-Yves. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of his talk, I went up to him and said, um, well, you know, you've got a big challenge for this Cousteau divers thing. You want to spread all over the world. You don't have any good sensing equipment that your divers are going to need. And he said, yeah, but that's a very complex thing. It's very tough to deal with. I said, he ever thought about St. Petersburg, Florida? He said, why would I do that? <laughs> I said, okay. I said, no, no, I got the picture. You come from Paris and I come from St. Petersburg, but how about, we, are you willing to Skype for 40 minutes? He said, yes, I would. So I put him on with Larry Langbreak. Mm -hmm. About 35 minutes later, he said, I'm coming over. Uh, and um, he's and been Larry's over three times. And Larry's from SRI. S Larry's from SRI and mm -hmm. one of the great people that um, used to be with the College of Marine Science and head of the Center for Ocean Technology. And then SRI hired him to lead SRI, and he's done phenomenal things. In any case, Cousteau came over um, and has um, decided, made Canterbury the very first school in the world that's formally associated with Cousteau divers. And the, the Canterbury School also has superb marine science teachers, graduates of Eckert and our graduate program, that are they're teaching a curriculum that was developed by our graduate students mm -hmm. over years with the Oceanography Camp for mm -hmm. Girls, which is a program our, our group started in 1991. So all of a sudden, you've got an elementary, a middle, and a high school situation where these kids are getting the best of science, and it's experiential. They're not just in the lab listening to a teacher. They're actually going out in the field. So then you can go to Eckerd, okay, undergraduate, right. and then you can come and get a PhD or a master's right here. That's incredible. I don't know another place that's got anything like that. And that is so powerful that when the group of Spaniards came for Dali, they took a look at that and said, we're going to go to the European Union. We want something like that. Hmm. Oh. And you went over, that's why you went over to yes. Spain. Yes, yes. Then I made a second trip because they invited me to come over and, and speak about a little bit. So. so, okay. So why do you think education is so important? Why do you think we should focus on that? Well, um, you can see what's happened to our, uh, basically, the, our, our small businesses and our manufacturing and everything. And we, we've really um, slipped. And it's almost, I, I think it, it may be in direct proportion, but maybe it's an exponential in relationship to our standing in science, mm -hmm. um, mathematics. Uh, it's way down. And I, um, I, I, the sad thing is I feel that, number one, the teachers have very little respect anymore, and mm -hmm. number two, they get little respect. They get little respect, and I think that, that in many ways sci our society doesn't tend to respect science. When I grew up, you know, it was a Sputnik era, and boy, mm -hmm. if you were going to be something, be mm -hmm. a scientist. That was, that was it. That's mm -hmm. no longer true, and somehow we have to change that around so that really bright people don't all want to go be lawyers or uh, business people. I mean, certainly we have to have both of those disciplines, but it's far and away, it's sort of gotten out of hand. Mm -hmm. So the small businesses in the United States that generate most of the new jobs, the innovation that you need in most cases is a technical mm -hmm. 
innovation, a scientific or mathematical mm -hmm. approach to something. It's not that you don't need the liberal arts, but, mm -hmm. but if you, that's all you have. Right. Um, you need the, both. You need both. And you yes. need people to do both. To do both. Yeah. So that's. Uh, I always thought of mathematics as a liberal art. Okay, that's true. Well, that's good. It, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Good, you got me, kid. <laughs> okay, so who has a question? Yes, can you? Can who? Katie, is that you? Okay. <laughs> I'm, the, uh, I don't know about the, the negotiations. I know that there's going to be a report, Katie, given next um, week by the, by the architects uh, for the lens. So uh, I also know there's uh, over 20,000 signatures on a, a drive to vote the lens out. And so unfortunately, it's become a really rancorous um, item for our community. Um, it's, it's troubling to me because I think the whole thing went backwards. In other words, uh, what would you, you'd like to think for? We have set this magnificent waterfront that, that, that most communities in the world would give their eye teeth to have. And it would seem to me what we need to do is have a master plan first where we all, all of us, get a chance to have an input and say, this is what we think we'd like our city to look like. This is how we'd like to utilize these wonderful spaces adjacent to the port and up you know, Lassing Park and so on and so forth. That, that didn't happen, so we're taking a very small chunk of real estate and then supposing, I guess, that we can redesign the rest of it okay. Um, and so I, I, I was very sorry about that. And I guess the other thing that was regrettable in a sense was that the, um, although the partnership wrote a letter and, and said that whatever you do, and this is about two years ago, please utilize the expertise that's resident in Babro Har Harbor, the scientific expertise, so that you can you can avail yourselves of the people that know about seagrasses or sediments or storm surge or whatever, and that didn't happen unfortunately. So you, you've got architects who are great architects, but they're working in a in basically in an environmental vacuum, which isn't good because I I know Penny Hall, Al Hine, who's sitting here, all of those people would have willingly given their advice to all of the architects so that at least whatever design was, was brought forward would have been done in, in a way that you wouldn't recreate Interstate 10 over Pensacola Bay so that we can get storm surge to just knock the bottom out of the thing, that kind of thing. So um, I don't know if I've answered the question, but I'm not privy to the inner workings of the negotiations. Is there another question? Yes, could you stand up and say your name, please? Sure, hi there, my name's Everett Rogers. Um, I'm an undergrad student over at USF, a biology student, and uh, I don't have any credentials. I don't really know anyone up in Tallahassee. I don't have a uh, great standing in the community or anything, but I do have a great interest in, uh, in uh, science innovation and a real willingness to be a part of. How would I or someone like me, my age, get involved somehow? In, it, in science or in innovation? Well, in, in, uh, in furthering the community. Well, um, many of the uh, our laboratories are. Uh, the, excuse me, I, I, I keep slipping back. Many of the laboratories at the College of Marine Science and at uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. If you're genuinely interested and you have a research project that interests one of the researchers or faculty members, you more often than not can get experience either in the lab and or diving in the keys to take a look at things like Amphistogyna. Um, and so there, there are plenty of opportunities. You just have to be a little bit aggressive about, um, you know, showing up and saying, "Hey, I'm so and so, and I've got this background, and I'm interested." Um, and in fact, Renee was a nurse. She showed up, and she probably—I'm not sure she had the background in biology you did. With the College of Marine Science has always been willing to take bright, young, interested people, and I think that's still true. So, any, almost anybody can show up and, and help out. Is okay. there anyone? here in marine science that 
he could talk with? Well, there's uh, Dave Campbell's having a, a uh, workshop with uh, uh, talking about internships tomorrow morning at STG. What's, it, what's STG? Uh, you know what STG stands for? I don't know. Science, Science and Technology. technology. Oh, that building. It's, yeah. it's, on the, yeah. it's on this campus. It's one of the buildings yeah. on campus, and there's a, there's a uh, get together. Yeah. Uh, it's where our paintings are. Yeah. yeah. No, it, um, it's the buildings where the Mickett Stack House paintings are. <laughs> <laughs> um, who else has a question? Yes, in the back, could you stand up and say your name, please? Thank you. And, um, I have a question. You were talking earlier about the seepage of food into it with respect to their article in Sunday's paper. Yes. Uh, and, and part of my kind of just ignorance, uh, I have an idea, but could you explain how that happens and how we can rectify that? Well, I can give you a good example in the Keys. The Florida Keys is a good example of an area where basically the people thought it was safe and okay to basically pump sewage underground. So if you put it down far enough, it, nothing will happen. How do you pump sewage underground? Under pressure. So you take a water pump and drill a hole in the ground and just start pumping. <laughs> and that's what they did. And then about um, maybe 15 years ago, um, several of our faculty, Joan Rose and John Paul, took a group of students down and um, sampled the waters and the canals in the, uh, the Keys. And it turns out uh, some of those canals had hepatitis. Uh, turns out the, the sewage very slowly, not surprisingly, we talked about calcium carbonate and How limestone. How does it get hepatitis in it? It's Just from humans. Oh. Okay, so it, it bubbles up through, very slowly migrates up through the rock and then comes into the canals and it even bubbles up offshore and in some cases it went under US-1, which is the main highway out to the Keys, and came up in Florida Bay. And some people said, oh no, that's impossible. This is, you know, doesn't work. So John Paul, who's a very shrewd guy, manufactured a phage in his laboratory. Manufactured a what? He, a bug. A bug. A, a microscopic animal. And he basically got something that was only found, wasn't found in the environment, but he got it grew lots of it in the laboratory, took it down to the Keys, flushed it down several toilets, and then just waited offshore. Mm. And guess what? About 12 hours later, it appears. Mm. So it's like a fingerprint. Mm. Could have only come from the toilet that John Paul mm. flushed, okay? Mm. So anyway, that um, Is it still happens. like that? I mean, I, have they I, fixed it? I'm not sure they fixed it. Uh, How would they go about doing that? You'd actually have to put in a sewage plant so that you could actually retain uh, and treat the material. But that, uh, well, would they pump it out like they pumped it in? Do they suck it out? Oh, I don't. Uh, boy, it would be really difficult. See, that's the problem with our the great Swiss cheese, this very porous thing that we have. Mm -hmm. It can migrate the water. It, in fact, it does migrate all over, and, I, and uh, I'm not sure we really understand yet just exactly so what the patterns are. So could we have key sewage here? I think that's highly unlikely. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> in fact, I think it's, I would, it's probably impossible. But um, you, you could get significant migration over uh, long periods of time in the Florida aquifer, which is down here. So that's, it's, it's a problem, and I, I don't know if I answered your question, but the but the point is that in almost every place in the state of Florida, if you put something underground and it finds its way in, under pressure to a porous rock, it's going to migrate through. So if it's sewage, get ready. Yes, sir. Could you stand up and say your name, please? Jim Brandt. And I recall you telling me, Peter, that we've been pumping sewage out of a sewer plant underground. They, that's, uh, yes, uh, yes, treated, treated, uh, it's tertiary, I think it's tertiary treated water, Tim, and they do force it way underground. The difference between the Keys and here is where they, St. Petersburg uh, pumps it down, 
seven or 800 feet down. The Keys wells are like 20 to 30 feet down. It's very close to the surface. Well, when you go down that far yes. here, what do you get to? Don't you get to water? You get to salty water, very salty water. So does it go out into the bay? Uh, I think the exchange rate is very, very slow. That, that, uh, but that, that is something that some of the experts from marine science would have to find out using probably tracers. Yes, will you stand up and say your name? I'm Marty Normal, a partner in crime. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Peter, when Carol asked you why is it important that marine science is here in St. Petersburg, you missed the opportunity to brag about what has happened since these four guys started in the early 70s. It described the, the breadth of the marine research contract in St. Petersburg. Oh, okay, so we had the four faculty and then, yeah. yeah, thanks, wow. Okay, the institutional cluster includes the College of Marine Science, which is about, I don't know, 250 people, SRI International, um, 70, Charles Dark Draper Laboratory, which is on the north side of town, they probably have about 20, Center for Ocean Technology, um, I'm not sure right now, they're, but they're the reason the Center for Ocean Technology was the big magnet for SRI. That's why SRI was attracted to St. Petersburg, okay? Because it's a technical capability. The Florida Institute of Oceanography, Bill Hogarth is the, the director, or, and uh, Jodica is uh, critically important to that group that serves the entire state of Florida. Any ship time, if somebody wants to use an oceanographic ship, they go through FIO. The U.S. Geological Survey um, Center, which is like 100 people, three buildings, so that's expanded from one building to three. Tampa Bay Estuary Program, Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, which is um, part of the state. It's a state laboratory, and it has well over half of the people, 350 researchers, turtles, manatees, seagrasses, fish populations. Are they here? They're here, 350 right down here. Yes. Right down near right. the school? Oh, they're an integral part of it. That big, new, beautiful building is shared between Florida Fish and Wildlife and the College of Marine Science. I didn't Science. realize there were 350. Oh, yes, there are. Wow. Including Robert Muller, who is a, huh. a, a well-known mathematical uh, biologist who's there. Um, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the National Marine Fisheries Service, which uh, Bill Hogarth is productively interacts with, the U.S. Coast Guard, some of whom have, they have some people billeted at SRI. Eckerd College, um, which is obviously is just slightly removed from downtown. Um, the Pediatric Clinical Research Center, uh, Bayfront Medical Center, all children's, and of course, what we need to add now, which is very, very exciting, is the Johns Hopkins uh, group, which is coming into town, which represents um, a so major So all thrust. of this has happened in 40 years? Yes. Oh, yeah. So none of this was here except the four people, five people. And, and, the, and the Fish and Wildlife Research they Institute, here. they were here. And then the precursor of the Florida Institute of Oceanography called SUSIO, State University System Institute, they had a, two research vessels. Mm -hmm. But it was less than 100 people mm. on the peninsula. And mm. um, now there are all those agencies with mm. about 14 or 1,500 people. That's a huge accomplishment. It's, but uh, there were so many people that, that uh, loved the, the idea and, and worked and collaboratively and um, were excited, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir, will you stand up and say your name? Uh, Joe Baker, I'm a local University of Georgia officer. Uh, I was just reading in a, from the New York Times from a couple of weeks ago about some research that marine uh, scientists are doing coast of Washington, a small island there, I think the name of it is Tassoon. Washington State? Or? Yeah, Washington State. Uh -huh. And, and uh, they, they found that the, the, the pH of the water was uh, uh, 10 times as acidic as it was a few decades ago. And this is having an adverse oh, sure. effect yeah. on the clams and mussels yep. and barnacles and so forth. And I was wondering, have, have the equivalent results that have been uh, uh, found on the west coast of Florida here? No, the, what Joe's describing is in fact a really serious affliction because um, almost the entire um, oyster industry in Oregon, Washington, and Northern California, uh, mm. 
mm -hmm. is uh, wiped out on a routine basis. So this is a, a multi-million dollar industry. The, the, the problem is that um, there's, there's a twofold problem. You, you, you get upwelling of very acidic, low oxygen water, and the, the oysters, the young oysters, the oyster spat, can't take it. They're very sensitive. And so it kills them right off. So if you get one of these events, then the oyster farmers are in trouble. Now, they can shut down things for a little while and sort of wall off the water, but eventually the oysters need to feed and they need oxygen. So that's a sort of a, you can only fix it for a little while. Um, some of them have, have moved their oyster beds to, um, there's a great big pond, and they can actually, um, they don't get these upwelling events that brings this acidic water. But yes, the ocean acidification, um, when each of you drove here tonight, maybe some of you walked or rode a bicycle, um, but when you drive, you, your car, your pipe discharges CO2. Um, every chemist knows, you can argue about global climate change, what you can't argue about is what happens when CO2 in the atmosphere gets near a fluid. It goes into the fluid and it decreases the, the pH, okay? So you get, uh, you, you drive things down into an acid condition and for many organisms, that's not, that's not good at all. So um, it's, and it's not just the oysters that are in trouble and the clams. It's the coral reefs, I suspect, and Pam can correct me if I'm incorrect. In, in addition to other things like sediments and nutrients and everything else, turbidity, this ocean acidification is gonna make it almost impossible for coral reefs to grow uh, as well as in the open ocean, you have little tiny organisms called pteropods. And, and this is something that uh, salmon like, that's an, inter, uh, an important part of their diet. Uh, when they go, my prediction is you will change the entire food web of the entire North Pacific Ocean. And there's nobody around I know that's smart enough to tell you what it's going to result in, okay? And I mean a biologist. A chemist can predict what the pH and alkalinity and everything's going to be. The biologists don't have a clue because it's way too complex. Okay. <laughs> Sir, I'm done. Before we get exactly, before we leave, could you tell us one good thing? <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you a good thing. St. Petersburg has some of the brightest young scientists in the world, and we've attracted them from all over the world. They are absolutely astounding people. So you get people like Jodica and Renee, you get people like um, Mike Morris, who started Ocean Optics. He's one of our graduate students. There are 230 people employed in the state of Florida. There's a dollar flux of probably $30 million a year. Our one graduate student, we have only had 700 in our lifetime, okay? Dave Mearns and uh, Lee Kump, both recognized by the University of South Florida. They are so good. They're both world famous. Burns is probably, arguably, the greatest marine explorer ever. He's a super sleuth, okay? So I, that gets me really excited. Okay. So hey, okay. yeah, okay. Okay, Sorry. on that note, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>